Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 11 and we are starting a section on shared libraries. Remember our discussion of the process layout in memory from week 06? In this series of videos, we'll revisit just how exactly the process gets from disk into memory. We'll also reach back to week 5, where we talked about the compiler chain and how it created different object files as one stage of the process before then combining these object files together with some shared libraries into an executable. These files created by the compiler are binary files, meaning we silly humans can't simply open them in an editor and read them. But that doesn't mean that they're just random streams of bytes. Binary files are well formatted too and have to follow a specific order just the same in order to be able to be read, loaded and executed. There are several such formats, a.out, cough, mac.o or the elf format. No wait, elf format? That's just like an ATM machine, right? Elf is the executable and linkable format. So there's no such thing as the executable and linkable format format, but okay. Now, notice that one format to describe executables or object code is a.out, or assembler output. The a.out format was used by older Unix versions, and as so often, newer tools wanted to retain backwards compatibility and not confuse the user by creating output named differently, and so our compiler to this day produces an executable named a.out, even though that file nowadays, on most Unix systems, is of type elf. Okay. So aside from the terribly named a.out elf executable, there are a few other types of files that elf can be used to describe. For example, core files, which we've seen some good use of when we talked about using the debugger to analyze program failures. Elf describes the process snapshot and its debugging information. Then there are your common object files. These files are referred to as relocatable files as the format allows the information retained in them, the symbols and other data, to be relocated, to be combined with other object files to form either a shared library or an executable. And of course, last we have listed here the shared library file, commonly ending in .so for shared object. These libraries contain so-called position-independent code that can be placed in memory and executables regardless of its absolute address. We'll see examples of each of these files throughout this series of videos, but first let's see what ELF describes or how an ELF file is structured. An ELF file is made up of an ELF header followed by some data. The data includes the program header table containing entries that point at different memory segments, such as the data or text segments, which we've seen in detail in our earlier video on the process layout as well as the section header table, containing entries that point to selected sections. The segments pointed to from the program header table are used to provide information required at execution time, while the segments pointed to from the section header table are used at link time. Let's take a look at the elf header inside uh, the elf.h header file, of course. In there, we can find out quite a bit about the structure of an elf file. We see that the header defines a few pieces of information about the file, as well as information about the program header table and section header table, etc. But perhaps it'll be a bit more useful for us to look at an actual ELF file. So let's start with a regular object file, such as when we compile a source file without linking it. The file command can look at the file and tell us what type of file it is. An ELF 64-bit relocatable object file compiled for the x86-64 architecture. How does it do that? If you look at the manual page for the file command, you will find out that it performs a few tests to determine the type of file. First, it may call stat and determine the type of file as reported in the ST mode. We're quite familiar with that call. But we also know that stat will simply tell us this is a regular file for something like the object file main.o, so the file command has to have something else up its sleeve. And indeed it does. The file command uses magic to find out details about the file in question. That is, most well-documented well file formats include a special magic number that is stored in a particular offset near the beginning of the file, and which you can then map to the type of file by performing a look lookup in a file catalog. Since that, trivial as it sounds, it seems indistinguishable from magic, we call that lookup file the magic file. The format of that file is documented in the magic manual page. And we use the magic library functions to perform the lookup. 
All right. I honestly only mention this here because I think it's pretty cool that we have a magic library and magic manual pages to use magic to look up a file type. But of course we don't need a magic library, and we like to understand how things work rather than wait for magic wand and hope for magic to happen. So let's take a look at the actual bytes in the file using our good friend hexdump. From the information in the elf.h header file, we know that the first four bytes here identify the elf header, with a hex 7f followed by the ASCII characters e, l, and f. The next byte defines the file class, 64-bit in this case. The next byte defines the data encoding type, the endianess of the system, little endian, or least significant bit first in this case. This is followed by a single byte specifying the file version, 1 in this case, and then we identify the OS ABI, the Application Binary Interface, as being the original Unix System 5 ABI, followed by some null padding. After that, at byte 16, the start of the non-ident header, we encode the ELF type, where 01 represents a standard relocatable object file. The next two bytes define the machine type, with 3E hex, or 62 decimal, representing the AMD x86-64 architecture, followed by an ELF version indicator and a few null bytes in the case of a simple object file, at least. But okay, reading hex bytes is not terribly convenient, and the file command is a lot cooler, but we may also want to get more information from the ELF file than the file command can provide. So we can use the read ELF utility, which presents to us a lot of the same information we just extracted in this neat layout. Again, the first few bytes say ELF, 64, little endian, version 1, system 5 ABI, ABI version 0, type relocatable file for AMD x86-64 version 1 with entry address 000000. So why is that field entry address all zero? Well, remember, the file in question is an object file that needs to be linked into an executable by the linker. Let's take a look at an executable instead. This looks almost the same, but with a difference that the ELF type is now an executable instead of a relocatable object file, and the entry address is now no longer zero. This entry address, which as you can tell is represented here as least significant bit first, little endian, at hex address 0x 400570, is where the program will begin executing. That is, this is the location where the standard C library startup routine start will be. Go back to our week 6 segment 2 video, where we changed the entry address, and if you were to compile a program with an alternate entry point function, you should see the address in the ELF header change. But so far we've only seen the meta information from the ELF file, there's a lot more bytes in the file. Let's see if we can make sense of those too. Here's our hex dump of the executable. The grayed out bytes are those we've already seen. These bytes over here tell us that there are seven program headers in total, starting at offset 64 or hex 40. The size of the ELF header is 0x38 or 56 decimal. The program header table has read only permissions and is of size 0x40, 64 bytes. And with that information, we now know that we can find the next header at the offset 0x38 plus 0x40 equals 0x78, which is down here. There, at the offset 0x78, the next program header begins. It's a program header of type ptinterp, specifying the program interpreter, with the read permissions with its content to be found at 0x01c8. So if we then look at the data found at that offset, at 0x01c8, we find the path of the interpreter specified as userlibexec ld.elfso. Again, parsing the hex bytes is tedious, so we can again rely on our friend readelf, which can present us the same information we just extracted. 
Seven program headers starting at offset 64, with a program interpreter to be found at offset 0x01c8, being user libexec ldelfso. Now what that interpreter does will be the subject of our next video. For now, you've seen a fair bit about the structure of an ELF file and how this binary format can be inspected and understood. To get a better feel for working with a binary format like ELF, I recommend that you play around with the tools and consider a few of the example exercises shown here. We looked at the .o and a.out files only. Repeat the same exercise for a core file in the shared library and see what changed. Try to build a binary for a different architecture. I386 is easily built and supported on our x86-64 platform, and see what changes. Build an executable with a different entry point, and see how that changes the address in the ELF header. Get familiar with the different tools that we can use to analyze ELF files. In addition to the read ELF utility, we also previously used the OBJ dump tool, and both have somewhat overlapping functionality. See what options each supports that the other doesn't. And of course, read through the manual pages and the header files to better understand the L format. In our next video, we will then look at the program interpreter, the so-called runtime link editor, LDLFSO, and further explore how shared libraries work. Make sure to check out the various links on the course website and in the slides here at the end. Until next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.